Yeah. There's one right in the hallway. Yeah. Now, good evening. This is the uh, March 13th, 2022 meeting of the Moscow Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, before we start with the first, I wanted to let you know that uh, Mike Nelson um, had tendered his resignation uh, to the mayor. We don't have a, a replacement, but I just wanted to let you know if you kind of wondered where Mike was, he, uh, he has resigned. So with that, uh, we'll get started with the regular agenda. First item is approval of the March 9th, 2022. Hello, Drew. <laughs> um, minutes, uh, do we have any additions, corrections, deletions? Uh, if not, if somebody would like to move for approval. Move to approve. A motion by Victoria, second. Second. And second by Rich. All in favor? Aye. 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 And opposed? Abstentions. Okay. Um, next is the public comment period. Um, is there anybody that would care to address the uh, commission with matters that are either not on the agenda tonight or before the city council? I guess not. So still, if anybody that's out there watching, uh, we would certainly welcome uh, your attendance uh, to come down and, and chat with us. So the next item is public hearing a proposal for rezone of approximately 1.7 acre area located at 536 South Mountain View Road. And Mike, I guess you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. So before you tonight, we have a uh, city of Moscow requested rezone of an approximately 1.7 uh, acre area property located at 536 South Mountain View Road within the city. And the city's requesting this rezone. Uh, it's 1.7 acres in size. And the proposal is to rezone from current ag forest designation to the uh, R2 zone, which is moderate density, single family uh, residential. So just to provide a little bit of background on this property, it was first uh, annexed into the city. It was formerly in the county in uh, 1996. There was an effort at the time to annex uh, a number of properties that were currently county islands, so completely surrounded by the city, uh, but still within the county. And although there were records of the city proposing to rezone the property from Ag Forest to R2 zone, uh, we couldn't find any records that it ever occurred. So within the uh, annexation ordinance, um, there was never a rezone ordinance where this occurred. And the properties remained ag forest uh, ever since that annexation into the city in 1996. Uh, and then in 2013, uh, we have a Mountain View Road improvement project that the city initiated in order to improve traffic flow and enhance safety. And it's pretty much extending from 6th Street and Mountain View intersection is down to Joseph Street intersection. Uh, and then during the design phase of the project, it was determined that in order for a roundabout to be constructed at the Mountain View Road 6th Street intersection, the property needed to be acquired uh, from the four adjacent property owners uh, to that intersection. And then over the last two years, he's been working with the property owners to purchase the needed property for the roundabout. And as part of the property purchase agreement for the portion of the property at 536 South Mountain View Road, uh, city is required to initiate, present, and administer the rezoning of the property to the R2 zone, which really should have occurred when it was annexed in 1996. So this is the subject property, 1.7 acres in size. Uh, you can see Mountain View Road, 6th Street intersection, uh, Picard Orthodontics there to the northwest of this property. Uh, Nazarene Church to the southwest. This is primarily residential development within the Rolling Hills additions to the east of Mountain View Road. And just a closer view of the property, currently one single family dwelling in the northeast corner. And then just a large, uh, large yard area there, um, the remainder of the property. Taking a look at the current comp plan, land use designations, currently designated as auto urban residential as well as uh, the majority of the surrounding properties on the east side of Mountain View Road. Uh, Picard, Nazarene Church are within the suburban commercial designation for their institutional and commercial uh, uses that exist on those properties. So taking a look at what auto urban residential means in the comp plan, it's primarily single family, lots ranging from seven to 11,000 square feet in size. Are really more isolated from surrounding uses, which requires more reliance on automobile transportation. 
Uh, designation includes those areas generally anticipated to be developed for low to moderate density residential uses, a density is between three to six units per acre, which could include a mixture of single family, twin home, townhouse, residential dwellings. And then it points to appropriate zoning designations for uh, the land use designation would be R1, R2, and R3. Brings us to the uh, current zoning configuration of the area. I mentioned before, property is currently zoned Ag Forest. Uh, all the property on the east side of Mountain View is currently designated the R2 zone. Uh, Picard Orthodontics there to the northwest is uh, neighborhood business. And then the Nazarene Church is really a mixture of R3 and, and neighborhood business for those properties. So this would be the proposal just to rezone the property to the R2 zone to be consistent with the area uh, on the east side of Mountain View Road. What the R2 zone means within the zoning code, uh, it's a moderate density residential zone appropriate in the following circumstances uh, where single family dwellings predominate the area. Terrain is not harshly irregular and smaller lot sizes can be accommodated without extensive earthwork. Utilities are available and adequate within the area. And the existing development patterns and policies embodied in the comp plan uh, also guide the application of the zoning district. And then really just primarily a single family zone. There are some other institutional type uses. So um, child care facilities. We also allow market and community gardens and public parks and rec facilities as well. Mountain View Road currently designated as a minor arterial. It is 36 foot wide uh, paved roadway with curb gutter sidewalks on both sides. There are bike lanes on both sides as well. And 6th Street is designated as a collector street currently east of Mountain View. Uh, to the west of Mountain View, it's currently designated as a minor arterial. And there are water, sanitary sewer and storm sewer mains in the area within the adjacent streets. That brings us to the uh, staff recommendation for the uh, commission before you tonight to conduct the public hearing and upon consideration of testimony received, recommend approval to propose rezone from the Ag Forest to the R2 zone with no conditions, and then direct staff to prepare the relevant criteria and standards document. I certainly stand for any questions that you have. Any questions for, for Mike? Uh, I actually have a couple. Um, how much of that property was purchased by the city? Um, I can't tell you the exact square footage, but it was around 1,500 square feet, I believe. So it's fairly, fairly minimal. Okay. I do have, I think I included a design of the roundabout here. It seems like the house across the street might be mitigated by the uh, roundabout, do you think? Seems like there's no problem with the uh, roundabout except- A little closer. So it's just you? this, yeah, you just see this corner right here is um, the property that was purchased. So it's fairly minimal, you know, it almost fit. We tried to realign it, slightly adjust the, uh, adjust it to the west. Um, to stay out of the properties on the east, but um, yeah. just Does with the design, like the, you just, uh, just couldn't do it. So the driveway on the uh, uh, property uh, to the southeast must be pretty close to the curvature of the roundabout. Yeah, not, not ideal, um, but existing driveway had the garage there. We do have a, a portion that's City of Moscow property tied in uh, to the park property, the Joseph Street play fields to the south. So mm -hmm. that helped a little bit. The property didn't extend all the way out to Mountain View Road right away. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, really had to purchase property just because of the you know 90 degree property corners from all these property owners. So uh, really ranged as far as square footage, but I believe, yeah, it was around maybe 1,500 square feet. Mike, the other question I had, and this is probably more just a curiosity than anything, is that um, in one, of it, there was a requirement as a part of the um, purchase, the city was required to rezone. So what what 
triggered that requirement? Was it a part of the contract with the owner? It was just negotiated between the owner of the property and the city at the time. So during the purchase of the property, um, you're able to go back and forth in negotiations as far as the sale price of that property. So we didn't you know, claim eminent domain on these properties. We worked with the property owner to acquire the portions of that property. And part of the sale and purchase agreement um, were, yeah, certainly negotiations between the city and the property owners. And that just happened to be one of the stipulations of this property owner. You know, it made sense um, to go to the R2 zone just because it should have sure. back in 96 when it was annexed, but never, never had. Um, so certainly, um, you know, we were comfortable with okay. facilitating the, the rezone request. Okay. Any other questions for Mike? Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, with that, we will open the public hearing. And uh, we'd first like to hear from anybody that is in support of the rezone. And seeing nobody come up, uh, anybody that would like to speak in opposition to the rezone. And not seeing anybody, any comments in a general nature? Yes, sir, if you would come up to the podium, please. And give us your name and address, if you would, please. Barry Tenney, 1505 East 5th Street. So I'm very close to all this. And my main interest is the bridge. But I thought I'd get updated on this also. And um, I'm for it, actually. I was just slow to raise my hand. Okay. <laughs> and I, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. And many of us are upstream, especially because we get flooded often. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that's that's really all I have to say. Okay. Super. Right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And um, Mike, I know this is probably somewhat irregular, but uh, does the city uh, need time to uh, close out the? The public hearing. Sorry, I. Oh, sorry. Well, I know it's kind of unusual that uh, the city is the applicant in this particular case. But before we close out the uh, public meeting, does the city have anything? My rebuttal from me. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll pass. Okay. <laughs> All right. With that, uh, we'll close the uh, public hearing. And uh, any uh, questions or conversations or discussion with the. Uh, Commission. It seems like it's uh, pretty straightforward, so we don't see much of an issue, at least from my standpoint. So, well, with that, uh, would anybody like to make a uh, recommendation uh, to approve? I guess, does this still have to go to council? It does. Yep. So we're just Correct. making our recommendation to send this to council for, Correct. for reason. Well, I recommend we approve the proposed rezone to the R2 and direct staff to prepare the relevant criteria and standards. Okay, so we have a... a Two-part motion from Victoria and uh, motion to second and Joel second. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And abstentions? Okay, I. Um, that's great. So uh, that part of, it's done. I do have a question um, about the RCS, the relevant criteria and standards. It, if we are approving something, we're already saying that it has met all of the relevant criteria criterion standards correct if that's the case i'm i'm heading back to the notion of pre-approving or approving at the same time the rcs when we approve i i'm just uh, i'm kind of looking at this and i'm going well we wouldn't approve this if it didn't meet the criterion standards so I don't see that it is jeopardizing or prejudicing the decision by saying uh, pre-approve the, so, else? Well, my response to that, I, I, I kind of see where you're heading, but when we have a, a, a project that has, uh, it's more complicated, then it, I think the reason for hanging on to uh, writing them all down and, and being aware of them 
is, you know, when Walmart comes in and has a project and we've got a hundred people in the audience and there's yeah. a lot of debate about it, yeah. you you'd hate to treat it cavalierly yeah, at that agree. point. Mm -hmm. And while this one, we could treat this cavalierly and it wouldn't matter. No one would matter. But occasionally, once every two or three years, we get one right, right. that is really uh, a, a difficult one that causes. Yeah. Uh, and, and at that point in time, what I think we want to have is a really careful yeah. uh, delineation. I, I think that's a, a fair point. And I, I actually had a, a brief side conversation with the mayor about the issue, and he shares your your concern. I think that uh, the appearance of uh, uh, prejudicing the, the outcome certainly would be there. So It does seem real pro forma, but again, I, I go back to uh, two or three of the yeah. uh, issues when, when you'd like to really now when the, when when the uh, when planning and zoning is not certain of which way to go, you read these a lot more carefully. Right. Right. You know? Yeah. No, it's a it's a good point, Victoria. You had so the staff already puts forward uh, every time a recommendation to approve or to deny or to add conditions and rework it. I mean, the, that's already there. If they're going, if we approve it, it's it's already set. It's I mean the information is already there, so so it doesn't have to. You don't have to go craft it. It's already here. Um, so if, if if we're going to approve it without conditions and everything, then we we could. But I would have some concern about the appearance of having pre. You know, when time is of the essence, which sometimes it is. And we, we, we consider it. Yeah. So okay. We well, I just thought I'd throw it out there and see what uh, Joel. And I would say that we have been known to occasionally make modifications to yes. uh, okay uh, to them, and I, th I think that is uh, an indication that uh, okay uh, pre-approval might uh, yeah problematic be problematic. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's good. I think one of the motivations that was in the back of my mind is if uh, we need to come back at the next meeting to uh, approve the uh, RCS, and that's the only thing that's on the agenda, it makes for a pretty short meeting. So, uh, you know, I, and that's fine. I mean, it's just, it's part of life, <laughs> well, <laughs> commission life. Is, so is if we were to not have the next meeting, it's the holidays, you know, it's Christmas or something. That would put, push it out yet another two yeah. weeks. So, like I said, time, when, if time is of the essence, when we're really slowing something down and it needs to get done, yeah. Yeah. then that would be a consideration. Mike, well, yeah. I, I mean, I certainly have the option of drafting relevant criteria and standards document to approve the night that, for instance, like this rezone's approved. Um, it was just the impression that the app, the outcome was predetermined. It was you know mm -hmm. pretty much always our concern with that practice. Um, but certainly for easy ones, it seems pretty fairly straightforward. We could, you know, begin to do that. If there was a change in the RCS, pretty much direct staff to change the document and then bring it back next time to approve it. So, you know, there is an option to to explore that. Um, certainly, I th think Cody shared that that's the way Boise currently does theirs, is that they draft those in advance. Um mm of the hearings and then if there's any changes come back afterwards or else they approve them that night sure. but it's just always been our concern that the outcome is supposedly predetermined if we already yep. have a approval document attached to the the packet but certainly you know we've we've done it before at a meeting earlier this year just because it was going to be a you know maybe we we're canceling the next couple meetings um, just from lack of agenda items. So we needed to keep the application moving on to council. And so we drafted it in advance. So, um, you know, certainly I don't know if, if uh, there's any harm in, in drafting the simple, you know, the fairly simple ones that, that come forward. And we could certainly do that or we need to keep it consistent on each application. So we can explore that okay. maybe a little bit further. I was just thinking that we, we certainly can have it in our mind that if a project is, comes where um, time is an issue, we could make the, uh, we could work on them. When we used to do that years ago, it was hard work 
and it was hard to think in front of the public uh, and write stuff down. And when you do that, you really, as I recall, we had a certain lawyer, a, a attorney in town that we used to, he was on the commission at that time, and he was our, our go-to guy because he was used to writing stuff down in a kind of legal manner that not all of us, us, us people who swear and do stuff, we mess up. And uh, so we used him a lot, but if we went to that, you have to um, go uh, find another attorney to be. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe we just need to, to leave this as if, if a particular um, rezone or whatever other presents itself that we think that it might be appropriate, we'll consider it, particularly if we're time constrained. Otherwise, we'll, as a general uh, case, we'll, we'll continue our yeah, current practice. So, yeah, we'll just kind of take it as it comes okay. at us. Then. Right. So, okay, I thought I'd just explore that. So in this particular case, the, what we've got is the, the motion to have you prepare it so it'll come back to us at the, at the next meeting. So there's okay. no urgency with this one. So, you know, certainly if we have lack of agenda items at the next meeting, we certainly can push that on. Okay. Just delay it another couple of weeks. It's no, no big deal on this. Okay. So, Super. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that discussion. So Mike, I guess you're back up uh, self storage facilities and residential zones. So this was the topic we introduced last time and the commission decided to explore it a little further. Um, I've gone and done quite a bit of research on other municipalities uh, throughout the, the U.S. Really try to focus on Idaho, Washington, um, but not every municipality has self-storage unit development standards within their code. So um, really just kind of got a collection and, and they really range from larger municipalities to smaller uh, one. So you'll really see kind of the range and just their development standards. I mean, some are focused towards <clears throat> self-storage facilities that are three stories and, you know, in, internally accessed, uh, climate cooled, uh, you know, really high end facilities like that to just your standard uh, exterior outdoor, you know, roll up door self-storage facilities. So um, really just wanted to go through and I've taken the excerpts of all these codes and Kind of highlighted, um, you know, a lot of the regulations maybe wouldn't pertain to us or you couldn't see, you know, how they would be applicable to, to our city. Uh, but I've really gone through and highlighted kind of in red there some of the uh, regulations that kind of caught my eye going through going through the code. Um, just wanted to go through the first one's Vancouver, uh, Washington, you know, right outside of Portland, um, going through self-service storage. Kind of gives a, a range of where they're prohibited, um, kind of within 500 feet, you know, really doesn't apply to us as far as transit corridors. Um, I thought it was interesting. Self-storage units shall gain access from the interior of building their site. And so you think about residential development. I think the majority of the examples in town actually are, you know, have access gained from the interior and they have the exterior of the buildings with no roll-up doors on the outside. I think that's just a, you know, result of, minimal cost with the travel lane design. I mean, you don't want an exterior travel lane where it's just additional asphalt on the outside that you're not accessing two, two sides of a building. And so- I, I uh, guess I'm a bit unsure as to exactly what the or site uh, means. Uh, that I, uh, I can see the uh, access from the interior uh, is, uh, probably beneficial to adjacent properties and so on, keeping things out of sight, but uh, uh, any access from the site uh, is hardly restrictive. Well, the, the access from the site would just mean that, I mean, the access from the interior would be yeah. in the, you know, those interior buildings where the right. storage units are in the inside, the site would be the roll-up doors on the exterior facing the interior of the site. As opposed to facing. It seems to me those two encompass everything. <laughs> well, I mean, they could be facing the exterior yeah. of the site. 
So, I mean, that I think that would be the yeah. concern. And, you know, if it's adjacent True. to residential, you would have a lot more activity of and noise of people accessing the roll up doors and moving their yeah. things potentially if it was on the outside. Yeah. But just looking at the, the typical design, you typically see those facing internally um, and at least the majority of the ones that we have here in town. Uh, and then a lot of these typically have what you can't use it for. So there's, you know, a lot of chemical storage, um, you know, there's a lot of regulations where it's outside storage of, of various, you know, junk type items. Uh, and then there's other type of businesses that are typically uh, not allowed. And I think our code just inherently would exclude, you know, those types of businesses being conducted from self storage facilities because it doesn't meet the definition of a self storage facility. So, um, but a lot of codes apparently go into a lot of detail as far as what's allowed and what's not allowed uh, within self storage units. So highlighted this one, for instance, you know, outdoor storage is prohibited. So all goods and property stored at a self storage facility shall be stored in an enclosed building. Uh, no outdoor storage of boats, RVs, vehicle or similar storage and outdoor storage pods or shipping containers is permitted. So, you know, we'll probably pose a question later on in the, the presentation of, um, you know, should all of the items be kept within enclosed buildings, you know, adjacent to residential neighborhoods. A lot of people have campers, boats that they may need access to, but you know, it's a lot less tidier of a look when they're outside of the building. And so what's the visual impact of, you know, maybe allowing <coughs> exterior storage or does it have to be at a certain location where you can't see it from the outside? So, you know, just, some, just something to think about. Uh, I looked at Bonner County. So, you know, North Idaho, Sandpoint area. Mike, where did the, the one from Vancouver, did it, where did it say where, where it could be, what kind of zone it could be in? Uh, I didn't see any uh, language to that. A lot of these are, so I, I didn't go through and, and look at exactly what zones they're permitted in. A lot of zones are either going to be mixed use zones or commercial zones. There are some municipalities that specifically call out residential zones. So I haven't found a whole lot that are, you know, specifically allowing them in residential zones. Yeah, I would think that would be the case. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But you're in a, you know, a lot of larger municipalities where there's a lot more industrial, a lot more commercial areas where they could accommodate, you know, a lot more land areas to accommodate, um, you know, additional storage unit development. And so... It really just ranges, but yeah, there's a couple of good examples actually from Idaho. I think Nampa or Meridian actually had developed some standards which allow them in residential zones. So typically, you know, as with our commercial developments of, of self storage units, you have landscape buffers um, here, type A, B, C, D uh, landscape buffers. Usually they're located adjacent to a street or around the perimeter of the site. Um, at least 10 feet in width, I think is their tape, type A landscape buffer. So generally these are gonna be for us, uh, commercial zones adjacent to residential zones um, will trigger these type A, B or C landscape buffers just depending upon uh, the intensity of the zone and, and what the other zone they're adjacent to is. And so if you have residential to residential, they're not gonna trigger our type A, B or C landscape buffers. And so. Um, you would need to put something in the development regulations that essentially required type A, you know, supposedly landscape buffers around the perimeter of uh, a self-storage facility uh, development. And that's what the majority of uh, these municipalities seems to you know, be doing. Uh, security fencing, I think this occurs anyway. I think everybody that develops a self-storage facility typically wants it secure. Um, and usually puts a six, at least six foot tall fence around the facility, really varies as far as uh, what, what it's constructed of. You know, you see a lot of chain link, but there are other requirements uh, that they maybe be masonry or brick, um, you know, which could be fairly substantial as far as the cost of a, a wall that surrounds uh, the facility, but really just varies. And then you typically have some type of hour of operation if they're adjacent to residential. So this one specifically calls out if abutting residential district or use, 
uh, operation should only be from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. And that's fairly common uh, among all these municipalities is 7 to 10 p.m. Uh, there may be one that's 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., uh, but most of them fall within that 7 to 10 range. You know, looking at some of the other regulations, you know, some require a, a maximum uh, square footage of all the units. Uh, some require a, a separation, basically for emergency services, vehicle access while there's people accessing uh, their storage areas. Uh, some address lighting. You know, we in our in our code for commercial development, we require full cutoff. So our city's pretty much full cutoff, dark sky compliant as far as the commercial uh commercial land uses and so a lot of that would already apply here and and so the question would be whether or not we go you know potentially above that uh, which would just be maybe limiting the pole height if there's poles in these facilities that provide downlight um, but a lot of the facilities here just provide building mounted you know wall mounted fixtures that shine down but uh you know something to think about i uh, looked at nampa So they go through a lot of detail about, uh, you know, located on property to butts a public street. Of course, every parcel in the city, we require to abut a public street as well, uh, unless you're going through a PUD. It has uh, linear dimensions, 300 feet from the main access roads. And then there's additional setbacks, uh, 150 tw feet between the roadway and a storage unit building, which is quite a bit. Uh, and then some of them actually require a setback between residential and that's what I've highlighted here at the bottom. So a public storage facility building shall be located at a minimum distance of 100 feet from any uh, single family residential or duplex residential zoning districts from any low or medium density designation on the comp plan, future land use map, uh, not annexed into the city and 100 feet from any existing residential building. So there's the, uh, you know, assuming that these are gonna be located, you know, close to residential, those are the setback requirements, which is 100 feet, you know, is about maybe a lot width, two lots width away, which is quite a bit. I don't know that we would look at, I mean, if we're integrating these into residential zones that we would look at any type of setback requirement other than maybe increasing the, the setback requirement for the lot that you're on to get a little bit of separation on the side away from um, some of the residential uses. Uh, going on Nampa, so buffer, so this is similar. So the no new storage facility or conditioned multi-level storage facility allowed within 2,500 feet. So this is similar to, you know, what you see in, for instance, like billboards, you know, initially Airbnbs, they started to regulate those with, you know, had to be a distance, couldn't be a certain, uh, certain number of feet from another uh, facility. And so that's what they're doing here. It has, can't be any closer than 2,500 feet from another uh, storage unit facility. And I don't know that we would, go that direction uh, on that. So then they go through structure appearance requirements. Any portion of a building wall visible from a public street longer than 100 feet shall include facade changes, such as bases, fenestration offsets, and wall plane jogs. So um, just looking at the interaction between the facility and the street, just to, you know, if it's gonna be in a residential neighborhood, does the building wall facing the public street need to be, um, you know, increased as far as uh, the building materials and, and articulation on that to fit in with the area a little bit more. Uh, external building materials and walls visible from the public street shall be limited to masonry. So brickstone, quality concrete, concrete block, glazing, EIFS systems, uh, overhead doors may be metal. Exterior finished materials should be non-reflective. Shall include at least three colors of three materials. So I think the concern there is you know, storage facilities that are uh, bright pink, like <laughs> trying to draw attention to the facility as more of an advertisement, you know, not fit, certainly wouldn't fit into a residential area. So that's where, you know, you get regulations like this. Uh, public storage facilities on properties that are contiguous to residential duplex or located in neighborhood business. Residential professional shall be limited in height to, of storage buildings to 10 feet at the edge of the eaves. You know, we really don't get the multi-story storage buildings here, except for storage spot, I believe is maybe our only one on Third Street, right? <clears throat> kind of 
by Lion Street by the university in Gormley Park. Uh, I think that's the only maybe two story facility that, but that's internal, obviously. Um, so we don't really get a lot of the, the internal facilities, um, but it's not to say that we could. And then thinking about, you know, typical, you know, it's typically single story measured up to the eave. And so it'd be 10 feet. I think that the majority of the ones that we have currently in town would meet that, meet that threshold. Uh, all service drives, parking areas, except for areas used by large recreational vehicle stores shall be paved. Parking areas exclusively designed for parking or recreational vehicles uh, may be graveled. So they have a little bit different regulations there. I mean, typically, I think we would want, especially in, if it was in residential, we would want everything paved just because of the dust, uh, vibrations, noise, nuisance issues that are associated with gravel. Uh, build, buildings may be used as perimeter side and rear yard fencing. However, when adjoining a residentially zoned or used property, a site, site obscuring fence between six and eight feet in height shall be placed on the property line. The storage facility and residential neighborhood buildings closest to the property line shall comply with the interior yard setback requirements pertinent to the zone, uh, which the facilities to be developed. And then the landscape buffer, so similar to those other jurisdictions, uh, landscape buffer, 15 feet, and it's described in that section, expanded to 25 feet and apply to any portion of the property uh, that are contiguous to a street, pathway, sidewalk, right away, or along any property line shared by residentially zoned property. And then this limits the, the lighting here. So it goes a little bit above and beyond, I'm sure, some of the other uh, regulations within their codes. So a pole light shall be limited to two, two lights per 100 feet uh, of service drive, shall not exceed 12 feet in height. And then they're also required to be cut off, which, like I mentioned before, ours already are. So we can look at the residential zones. I think our residential pole height are all already going to be fairly low. You know, motor business, the maximum is 25 feet. I think residential zones, they're already going to be in that 10 to 12 foot height limitation. So we could certainly look at what our existing code would, would allow there. Uh, Pasco County, Florida. Looking at their performance standards there, you know, like maybe mentioned in some of the other jurisdictions, uh, just kind of spelling out exactly what's allowed to happen within the, the buildings themselves. So limited to dead storage only, uh, limited incidental sales of storage materials and accessory uses, customarily incidental self-storage facilities, uh, self-storage bays shall not be used for any other use than dead storage. What is dead storage? <laughs> Pretty much it, it's just storage of goods. Okay. And things that aren't being actively sold, I would imagine, <laughs> is, is what dead storage is. Um, and I, I mean, typically this is covered by the uh, the fire department mm -hmm. as far as storage of toxic, hazardous, mm -hmm. flammable, explosive materials. Um, but certainly something you know you'd be especially concerned with being adjacent to residential. So he certainly could include um, you know some language in the code about that. They go through, you know, similar buffers and then aisleways. You know, we have parking lot standards, which really determine the, the width of an aisleway, which is typically 20 feet. Uh, usually fire code dictates the width just because the facilities are usually so large that a fire truck needs to maneuver and turn around. And they're usually 26 feet in width for, for fire truck access. Um, so I don't know that we necessarily need to, to spell that out. I, you know, I think fire code, the fire department would automatically kind of stipulate that, but we certainly could maybe spell out the minimum width of 20 feet just because it's not completely clear. It's not necessarily a parking lot. It's a facility that may or may not have any off street parking, depending upon if they have a sales office on site. So it might be something to, you know, to have in the code. Um, and then, you know, just put this in there to kind of think about the different types of storage that may be occurring. Um, they have kind of freestanding recreational vehicle boat storage. So they've kind of defined four types could be fully enclosed, could be semi enclosed, uh, could be covered parking or it could be open. And so, you know, it's just something to think about if this, you know, you typically would just think of this is all fully enclosed uh, storage of dead goods. 
but uh, you know, it could be something else. It could be those boats or, or RVs uh, that could occur as well. And, you know, I think that that would be still a benefit to, especially to adjacent, uh, you know, high density residential areas that you may live in a townhouse, but you don't, you know, you can't store your boat there. And so, um, you know, I, I think it has some benefit, but certainly want to kind of mitigate the, the visual impact that, that that would bring. So uh, Grants Pass, kind of central, central Oregon. Um, they do. So this kind of goes back and forth. This is one of the, the jurisdictions that goes through self-storage facilities and commercial zones and then self-storage and residential. I mean, a lot of these regulations, I, I think, that apply or don't apply to the direction that we're going as far as allowing uh, res self-storage and residential. Um, they have some commercial requirements here. And then these are the, really the self-storage and residential. And this is more directed towards just kind of regulating storage facilities on residential developments um, that are only intended for the use of the tenants of those developments, which we would just allow by right now. I mean, you have an accessory building that's adjacent to apartment complex. As long as it's used for those tenants of that building, then you typically would be able to, to build that storage facility as long as it didn't exceed, for instance, like our maximum size limitation for accessory structures in that zone. So, um, you know, they specifically kind of spell that out here, but we don't necessarily need to. Uh, Arvada, Colorado, this is kind of a suburb of Denver, but they have some kind of good ideas here. So public access to any storage unit with 150, a residential zoning district, uh, container residential use and a mix is not allowed. So this is 10, 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. So it has that similar time frame uh, when you can't access it. Uh, they have similar language down there. Individual storage units shall face the interior of the site. Does not apply to storage units within an enclosed structure. That's kind of clarifying your, your question, Joel. Uh, Centennial, Colorado. So that they require a enclosed brick or other masonry perimeter wall, not less than six feet in height, uh, additional landscape or additional buffering, such as increased wall height, berming or intensive landscaping may be required by the city uh, to achieve some, some goals there, purposes by the city, uh, kind of buffering those views. They don't allow a self-storage unit or other area to be visible from any public right of way, except through openings such as gates. Gates have to be, or fencing have to be designed in a manner to balance the aesthetic compatibility of self-storage facility within the need for security. So colored metal or wrought iron are, are uh, encouraged. Use of chain link or barbed wire is prohibited, which we would already prohibit barbed wire except for industrial zones here in the city. Uh, they have specified building setbacks. So front and side street setbacks shall be 40 feet. Uh, those requirements supersede corresponding requirements for that zone. So that'd be something similar to what we'd be looking at. So our side yard setbacks are a minimum of five, which would be fairly close uh, to the adjacent property. Uh, so we'd be looking at maybe increasing that a little bit. Uh, required facilities, thought this was interesting. I mean, I don't know that I've been to a self-storage facility that has a restroom facility except for ones with on-site offices. Um, so, you know, usually you're there for a short period of time and then you leave, uh, but that was unique here. Uh, trash dumpsters, so they typically, for any commercial development, we typically require a dumpster to be located on site, so that's typically already included. Until they get quite a bit of snow, they've got a snow storage section there. Uh, that goes through requirement to, for snow storage. Uh, architectural design, which is which is pretty tight. So flat roofs are prohibited. Uh, they require a pitch roof for those facilities. And then this is kind of similar language as far as those re highly reflective colors uh, that could could pop up and typically you'd see those in more commercial, but they're prohibited here. Uh, and then Ada County. So they have self-storage, self, -storage, self service storage facilities uh, requirements down there. Uh, perimeter storage facilities shall be completely fenced, walled or enclosed, screened from public view. Fencing materials should complement the exterior building materials. Uh, no structure facility, drive lane, parking area, nor loading area shall be located within 20 feet of a residential zoning district unless a six foot tall 
sound reducing walls provided. And then they have the similar time frame for access of so 7 to 10 p.m. Uh, they, they dictate a parcel size. So we talked a little bit last time about whether or not you know, we thought it maybe was prudent to stipulate a minimum size of development or a maximum size of development. Uh, here they have a minimal par minimum parcel size of five acres shall be required for any outdoor storage. No, sh no facility shall be greater than 15 acres in size. And then they have that distance, 100 feet from a residential property line, exception of a boundary adjacent to a public right of way. And then other design standards that are included uh, in there as well. And then Meridian, I think, was maybe the one of the main ones that had residential. So they, they've incorporated self-storage facilities in residential. And they have uh, quite a few development standards just specific to those uh, residential zones. So size of the facility shall be limited to 35% of a residential development, not to exceed a maximum of eight acres. Hours of operation, so 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. here. Uh, they stipulate a distance between structures shall be a minimum of 25 feet. Maximum height building should not exceed 35 feet, which is fairly tall. A lot of our residential zones, you're going to have that same building height as 35 feet, so that would be the question. Uh, storage facilities shall be fully enclosed and screened from public view. No outside storage should be allowed. Materials shall not be stored within the required yards. Building shall be designed to the architectural character of the residential area. Building design shall comply with traditional neighborhood district design standards. So they have specific uh, design standards in their um, Meridian architectural standards manual that would have to comply here. <laughs> and that's pretty much the all the jurisdictions that I, I was able to find that has specific uh, use standards for self storage facilities. Um, just a reminder of really what our definition is of self-storage facilities really encompasses, um, you know, rooms, compartments, lockers, containers, also includes outdoor space right now. So um, in commercial zones, it would include the, the RV and boat storage. So that's something that we would have to think about as far as these designs, development standards, whether or not we're going to limit the indoor outdoor space and the facilities if we choose to move forward. And then we were talking about the zones where it could potentially be allowed. We were thinking R3 all the way up to neighborhood business, um, already allowed in, in motor business and industrial, and then a permitted accessory in RTO. So then just to kind of sum up a lot of the things we just talked about within the, the municipalities, so development standards. So thinking about landscaping, we already have standard buffer yards in our zoning code. Uh, this is just showing A, B. We actually have a C. Uh, we use, use C in rare circumstances. The, the zones really have to conflict. Um, but these are typically fairly common, depending upon what the development is. But type A, these can be reduced to 10 feet in width if the irrigations, drip irrigation is provided. Uh, but really, it's just a certain number of plantings per 100 lineal feet. So type A is two canopy trees, four understory trees, and six shrubs every 100 feet. Uh, Type B is more intense, so it's four canopy trees, 600 story trees, and eight shrubs uh, per 100 lineal feet. So it really just depends on the zones, but yeah, we would be thinking of uh, potentially just requiring, you know, a perimeter of all storage, self storage facility uh, developments, potentially uh, one of these landscape buffers. Uh, setbacks, so typical residential setbacks, you're going to have 15 feet in the front, uh, five on the side, but both sides have to equal 15, uh, and then 20 in the rear. Landscape buffers obviously require 10 feet in width, so you're already having to put it, you know, set those back 10 feet, even though the setback may be five on those, on those sides. So, um, you know, if there's a buffer required, then you're already going to have that 10 feet. But yeah, thinking of Kind of these facilities and proximity to residential you look at some of these other jurisdictions and they're setting them back you know 100 feet from any other residential development um, i think that's you know too great but certainly five feet away is is uh too close in, in my mind so yeah thinking about setback requirements 
is there a minimum or maximum size of facility? You know, we saw a few that, that dictate that. Then building height, you know, a lot of the ones we have in town are just a single story, probably meet the 10 feet to the eave. Um, should, should those be limited to that? I mean, residential zones typically allow up to 35 feet in height. Uh, is that too intense to have a, you know, multi-story facility next to a residential development? Or should they be limited to a single story? Fence construction, majority of the fences we have, I think are chain link currently. Um, should there be a certain material dictated on, on that? Should the material maybe just be adjacent to the, the street so it fits in a little bit better or should it extend all the way around? Um, you know, thoughts on that. Certainly limited hours of access seems to be the 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. is the, the common there. Should they face the interior? I think the majority of them already do. Should they be fully enclosed? Should we allow outdoor storage, you know, RVs, boats, et cetera, which I think probably would, would serve a probably a large portion of the purpose of, of a lot of the storage, storage areas, or should those be on the perimeter, you know, Pullman Road, Pullman Highway? Uh, additional lighting restrictions. We have to take a look at what our, our current pole heights are, but I think they're fairly fairly minimal for residential. We already cry our full cutoff on all of the fixtures. So um, I don't know, you know how, more, how much more restrictive we could go as far as lighting. Maybe a separation from property lines for any fixture. You can maybe take a look at that. Uh, separation from other storage facilities. You know, some don't allow storage facilities within a certain distance. Fairly hard for us to keep track of that. You know, it's been a bit of a problem as far as billboards to try to count how many we have and the separation. And so it's doable, but certainly adds another layer of uh, administrative uh, involvement there. Paving, travel aisle width, et cetera. You know, just because it's specifically not a parking lot, probably be a good idea to at least include that there's paving required and, and stipulate a travel aisle width. Uh, architectural standards, you know, do you look at additional building materials or increased uh, building materials on the exterior visible from the street, uh, reflective materials, you know, is what we looked at. So, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Okay, thanks, Mike. So, uh, comments or questions? In my opinion, I think... I think the parcel size is the key. You know, we don't want somebody to take a lot and try to stuff RVs or cheesy mini storages on a small lot in the middle of a neighborhood. And I, I keep coming back in my head to uh, if you are going to put one of these into a residential area, you, you don't want it. You want it to be in keeping with that residential area. And I, I don't know if you get to that through the architectural standards. Uh, some of it would be certainly a minimum. minimum. I, you could see, uh, could meet all the requirements of uh, height and materials, but you've got this uh, huge building in the middle of uh, uh, 2,000 square foot, uh, or, or even if it was larger uh, apartment buildings but so i i'm i really think we need to be pretty firm on some of the standards um yeah i think you're trying to screen it and buffer it um you know on, on those side property lines i think a lot of these facilities where you're going to be able to actually view it from like residential so this is the rodeo drive development they have all the duplexes that are along i think it's jefferson street um, could be Washington here on the, that this would be the East and the top of your screen. And so there's probably, I mean, this is a larger facility. There's probably six, seven lots that are adjacent there to the East. And so that kind of gives you a scale of, of the size of development there. But I think a lot of these, I mean, it, it seems to be a fairly good neighbor as far as not going to get a whole lot of noise at the, you know, at night. You're going to be not going to be a lot, whole lot of activity when it gets dark. Um, and then they're, what we have here is they're trying to buffer 
the development from the residential. So there's a type A, type B buffer that's required there. There's also a buffer that's required on the residential uses over here. So, you know, I think when the that landscaping gets mature, they have a fence located over there. I believe that it's a solid fence, but I, I can't, I don't know for sure. Um, but everybody certainly on the back sides of the residential lots has built a cedar six foot tall fence there. So I think at some point in time, once the landscaping gets mature, you probably won't even be able to see it on the side, but you'll certainly be able to see it on the street side, you know, and that, that would be, I think that's why a lot of the jur jurisdictions end up stipulating, um, you know, street facade improvements or, uh, you know, higher, higher profile building materials on that. What's the side. zone of this uh, piece of property? This is motor business. Um, yeah. But there's R3, which is residential, directly adjacent to it. So it is adjacent to, to R3. And that kind of raises, I, I think we saw that in several examples where it didn't have to be in a residential zone district, but there were several that were mentioning adjacent to, uh, which would be the case here. So I would think that we would want to have standards that um, would apply to being adjacent to a residential area. Mike, are you saying uh, we don't have any uh, zone, any com uh, commentary in our zoning code about uh, storage units at this point? We don't, just that they're uh, permitted, you know, what, what zones they're allowed in, but we don't have any specific sure. standards for self-storage facilities. Hmm. So, uh, the one I'm familiar with is Storage Spot because it's by Gormley over where I am. And that is a two story. It's also on a kind of a mall, it makes it even higher. But it's not by any residential, it's by Gormley Park and, and Road. So uh, I would think having, and it has um, sign, signs outside that give temperature and advertising. We didn't mention that. They have advertising lighted signs which uh i don't know that that would be something you would want in a residential area so uh i i i wonder about if, if i were a resident having a two storage storage unit next door to me would bother me it's by gormley park so that's not a problem but if it's next to houses mm -hmm. that could be an issue and yeah. and also that advertising signs that are neon signs or I guess they're all lead now, but you know. It seemed like the uh, the examples that you use uh, they did talk about being compatible with with a similar kind of size and uh, structure of of the neighborhood, whatever it was. On the other hand. Most of the examples that you've given are not places where I particularly would want to live. I, in other words, you didn't look for any uh, classy little, even Sandpoint would be, let's think of a couple places in Idaho where we might think, wow, we'd like to live there. Do we want to live in CUNA? Probably not. And, and so uh, that's a that's a dilemma. I I I don't want to. You know, I'm a Boise guy, so I don't see um, Nampa as a, a uh, an alternative. <laughs> County yeah. either, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, you know, it it just seems to me that the uh, as we uh, talked last time in in uh, our four zone where you have apartments that are uh, two-story things, all of a sudden uh, it's e easier. Uh, I, I don't know how many are aware that several of the uh, units on A Street have garages and rows of garages, but no student wants to park their car in a garage, hello. So we now all the uh, the uh, property uh, <coughs> managers use those garages as storage units. Uh, I I don't know if there was any permission or not, but that's the way they're used. And so you, you have the garages that are uh, that are there. But most of the um, 
And so they, they fit in pretty well, actually. Uh, most of the uh, apartments along A Street are all two, at least two stories. Maybe there's even some uh, three-story ones. So you can see kinds of vertical things. I worry about this, uh, the big footprint, though, Michael. That seems to be the biggest issue to me. You begin to think that in our four zone, where there are lots of, of apartments, you could begin to think of the uh, storage units that are two-story things where you, uh, uh, they, they again, fit in with the, uh, with the buildings that are in that area. And you see those in uh, these fancier uh, towns, you start to see a, quite a lot of these two-story ones yeah. that have elevators and the whole business to for whatever you want to uh, uh, store. It's a little surprise for those of us who just think that a storage unit is this ugly <laughs> thing out on the um, edge of a town. You know, I, I don't know what the economies of scale are for something like this. I mean, obviously, um, somebody isn't going to invest a lot of money if it's not going to pay off. But don't I recall when we were talking about this at a prior meeting that there was an indication that a lot of people uh, are just using these as place markers uh, for uh, holding on to it, making a little bit of money to, that, and then it's the value of the land that will be ultimately developed is, is going to be. So I, and I, I, I don't know that my point is anything other than just raising the issue, but if we put in such strict standards that uh, the investment required is going to be so significant, uh, maybe it will discourage people from doing it at all. And if, if part of the goal is <coughs> that we need more storage uh, available. So something to, to think about anyway. I, I mean, I guess we'll have to have some balance in whatever kind of architectural standards or uh, the way the facilities look. Um, I'm also thinking that I don't, if I'm a, a resident, I don't want to see boats and RVs. You're going to have them, you better hide them. Because I don't want, <laughs> otherwise, it looks like a used parking lot. I don't want to see them. <laughs> but I think it was all access from the interior. I mean, that's kind of like... So if you have a two-story house... However you're going to disguise it so I don't see it. <laughs> Both with access from the interior, and there's something all the way around. I mean, I see how you'd have to kind of go in there to see it, even if it was. I, mean, I don't know. I, I could see how you could have storage units all the way around the perimeter and have outdoor storage on the inside. Well, I mean, if they were like carported, or I mean, I just don't want to see them. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But like, if we're we're talking about limiting it, just going to that ten foot eave height, most RVs and boats can't get the ten foot eave height as well. So. And the I'd pictures you had were on the highway uh, where it was all bare ground. Oh, and someone said how ugly it was. Joel was ugly. <laughs> yeah, ugly. And I don't want to see ugly. It's an interesting issue about flat roofs, too. I noticed that one of the statements there was a uh, no flat roofs. And while I tend to agree with that, my modernist architecture friends your classic design knows would be really upset with me uh, when I say that because uh, Mies didn't know anything about uh, roofs. He just, there was nothing about a flat roof in his whole. Uh, that pavilion, Barcelona pavilion. So I, I do think that the idea of um, having structures that are compatible with the uh, zone that they're close to is, is pretty, pretty uh, irrelevant so that um, the, you would look like it fit into the um, into the area. We don't have many. I, I think there's only two flat roofed houses in town actually. So the, we haven't met and, and uh, most both of them are pretty well hidden, so hardly anyone knows where they are. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. And yet, I, I after all the discussion, I am embarrassed to say 
that I do have a storage unit myself. So <laughs> I, I don't want to, uh, I want to be uh, clear about that. <laughs> So, Mike, do you need what kind of? Oh, Drew, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, so, I mean, I recognize that there's kind of a need, kind of nationwide for storage, like in general. I don't know if that speaks to our society that we're just like pack rats, but like that's not kind of why we're we're here today, right? To talk about that. <laughs> but, um, you know, for me, it's is there a way within development, especially multifamily? to encourage within those developments to have better storage or adequate storage. And I know that doesn't address like boats and RVs and, and anything like that, but it's, it's incorporated into the development and how they want to, it's just not for the people that are living there. It's for multiple people. It seems like a better solution having a standard that way. Um, Cause I think a more pressing issue is land for housing rather than land for storage. And in the long term, if we're trying to find, you know, if we're trying to fulfill that need, I think it's more important for growth to have that in more resident, residential areas than places to store lots of people's stuff that they see once a year, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, I don't know, I, I'd, for me, I'd rather entertain that idea for multifamily and, and find ways you know, if, if I was moving into a neighborhood that was single family, um, I guarantee the realtor that's not going to be the highlight of the pitch, you know, someone moving to the, to the place, right? I, I can see, though, for a multifamily area, yeah, that's, you know, that's kind of suitable. Um, and we've talked about architectural, some type of standard, I think it's good. But in my mind, it's, I think, a better way, like in 50 years, just to have it as part of the development and somehow, I'm not saying like a financial incentive, but some incentive involved to encourage that within developments, I think is more beneficial for the community at large. Yeah, I, mean, I think part of the issue is, I mean, we require or we used to require that uh, people have a garage right at their, their house. But I mean, how many garages end up being just full of, of things instead of the actual intended use, which is the automobile to be able to park there. Yeah. And so I it's just hard for us to require something and then regulate that into the future. I mean, I think you mentioned that uh, a lot of the storage units that are built as part of the apartments uh, end up being rented out to non people that aren't living there. Yeah. And so we've seen that a little bit, you know, through, through town. And We're I think that's, you know, part, could be part of the Velma. I think that's okay from, from my perspective, because it's already part, no one's going to design something multifamily and have it look opposite, right? And so we, we already achieve the aesthetics and whether someone in the development wants to rent that or not, the, you know, the developer can use that for anyone in the community, right? And rent it out the same way. They have parking requirements. To me, that seems, I don't know, exploring some, that type of route, but you're right. You know, I'm, guilty of having a garage that I can't park anything in right now, mostly because I'm remodeling a house. So, <laughs> you know, I don't have a shop, but, um, and, and I say this too, and, you know, since last meeting, I did a little bit of research. I mentioned this. So the, the firm that I work for last year, um, our gross revenue was a, a quarter of what we did for all four quarters was of storage facilities. Um, I'm not working on those, heaven forbid, but, um, you know, uh, you know, so the, I mean, and directly, indirectly, this is affecting my, you know, my, what I do for a living, yeah. but um, they're also not being proposed in areas in residential areas, right? And so I see the need. I think there's a problem, but I, I think we have to be careful about the solution that we're proposing for the long term. So, yeah. if I might, Mr. Chair, yes. I, what you're describing resonates because, like, my parents stopped renting a storage facility as soon as they could put a shed in the backyard to store that stuff. And so it's like, who are we trying to solve the problem for? It's for people who don't have the flexibility on their existing land or wherever they're living to, to meet the need. So I, 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 I really enjoy this discussion and I know, I, I know it's an action item and it is a discussion, but I, I wanted to share like, 
I know the motivation is to encourage us to see some of, to enable landowners or people who may be looking to make an investment to do something and, and see that kind of mixed use in, um, in residential. But what I'm sensing in a lot of those sample things is like everyone's trying to predict what that someone's going to come in with a hot pink storage unit facility and what, what tool is going to be at our disposal to that's driven by code and zoning code to be able to say yes or no more than just a public testimony. And I don't want, I, I get nervous when we're trying to, where we may end up painting someone into a corner and make it seem like we're adding more hurdles when in reality, we're just trying to make sure that we're maintaining this balance for our residential communities while also making sure that uh, we're making it easy. So it's it's been interesting to, to think that we're going to add some code to actually ultimately make a decision easier for a business owner or someone who may be looking to be entrepreneurial that in turn can seem more difficult. So this is really cool to see this process from start to finish is what I'll say. Yeah, I'm not against pe like on you know businesses growing up. And I think hurdles are a good thing in, in this case, right? Because mm -hmm. then it encourages the hot pink or you know, <laughs> advertisement things. Right. But um, I guess my perspective is from multifamily actually storage within the facilities. For example, in some of the work that I'm doing in Seattle, like we're, requ we're required to provide a certain amount per unit of storage space that can fit. You know, we we're going by like the cubic yard. I think that's a really good solution because then, you know, because who wants to live in a, a studio or any building that doesn't have a closet. Right. And so that that's what they're kind of getting at. And I'm not saying we're putting har that harsh of a regulate um, regulation, but somehow like yeah. accommodating that where in the code, when we're designing things on a multifamily level, it's, you know, this is a metric or something to, to keep in mind. When, when we're building those out. Sure. I think we are talking about it in the R3, R4, RO, and neighborhood NB, right? So like, we aren't really talking about, I don't even think we're discussing it in yeah. like R1 or R2. Yeah, yeah I don't We're already so. talking about like but this in zones where the minimum is duplex, right? I mean. Yeah, R3 would allow twin homes, townhouses. So, um, I, yeah, I mean, we could even scale that back and just start at R4. You know, I'm just kind of playing devil's advocate a little bit. Like, mm -hmm. if you're trying to give incentives to but, somebody doing doing like multifamily, uh, I mean, I've been on the other side where we're looking at, okay, well, can we we can we use some of this as some of our parking requirement? Like, and I, I think there can be some other problems that that can create by trying to encourage storage in apartment areas. I mean, I can see where I've seen that become a problem is what I'm trying to say. So, well, I mean, you have an R4, RO, you certainly could have twin home townhouse development. I think, you know, apartments may be a little bit different of a story as far as the storage facilities that are available because those are usually built in. I think a lot of the apartments that Bloom's built on like A and Baker have a little storage nook out there on the porches that they've incorporated as part of that. Um, but I think you got a little bit different of a scenario with like twin homes and townhouses where all they're sharing the common wall. They may have minimal setbacks in the front and the rear, and they may or may not have garages. You know, we don't require garages anymore. Um, just trying to accommodate more affordability in housing. We eliminated that requirement. So we require, you know, at least one or two parking spaces, but there's no garage requirement. So, I mean, that was kind of the idea with a lot of these is that we're trying to promote as much density as we can in twin homes and townhouses and apartments. Um, and that's, you know, people still have their things and they're going to store it somewhere. Um, as possible to, kind of those developments. And so that was really kind of the whole idea behind, you know, thinking about integrating it more, but um, yeah, certainly not married to anything at this point. We can go any direction you want to go. Well, I think it really brings up a, uh, a, a, a kind of a design review process for, for adding uh, storage. You can understand, uh, I, I think I mentioned it last time that living in an apartment is uh, really a struggle and people do need uh, uh, places we, uh, I, I had never uh, 
live in that situation until and here I was in a small apartment and there was no way in the world that we could, uh, you know, where were you going to put just your basic uh, things like your, uh, your uh, suitcases and uh, trunks and extra whatevers. So immediately we were racing down the street screaming <laughs> where, and long, of course there are every basement in a, every apartment in New York City has storage units in the basement. In, and you go and buy a little, a 10 foot or 12 foot, but 12 foot thing to uh, store stuff in. So you can see that it's, a, uh, I think it's pretty critical for um, the R, R4 and even R3 zones to, to think on it because it, it uh, you can see that it's a problem. Most of those of us that have larger lots, you know, as uh, Haley was saying, you know, you can run out and buy a, a little barn and put in a cute little barn and put in your backyard to uh, store things uh, in as well. So it is a, it is an issue. I don't want to make it sound like it isn't uh, an uh, an issue, but it does seem like. Uh, it, they have to fit in, I, so, I believe. Mike, did, did I interpret correctly that there are currently no standards for storage facilities other than what zones they're permitted in? Yeah, we don't have any standards. So uh, it seems to me that we're, we're really talking about a, maybe a broader issue here where we need standards. I think we'd like standards, but we're also going to visit this residential piece of it in establishing the standards is that kind of i think in order to you know better fit in with residential areas you develop the standards to follow in order to help mitigate the impact of those facilities in the residential areas i don't know that we necessarily apply the standards to motor business and industrial zones okay um, but you certainly could but yeah, I mean, it was more of developing standards to help mitigate the impact of that and in more intensive use on the residential character of the area. And that's why you would, you know, that's why pretty much everybody's developed these standards in order to help it fit in with that area and cause less conflicts between the two uses. So it, it occurs to me that it's a little bit more complex issue than I had originally thought it might be, but I think it's worth pursuing. I mean, I'd like to, to continue to try to, to move through this. So. Well, I just want to also mention that we've mentioned the affordability of building these things so that they, we, we don't want to make them so fancy that nobody's going to do them. Nobody's going to build one. But, and I like Drew's idea, although it's complex. And that would add cost to making a development. And that brings up affordability there, where we want affordable housing. So it's complex. That's where I'm saying it's going to be. Yeah. Joel? I, I remain very, uh, well, I, I guess the whole issue makes me nervous. But the, the uh, I'm, I'm especially nervous about the uh, uh, idea of outdoor storage of boats or uh, RVs or whatever within uh, uh, residential uh, zones. Um, and I'm, I guess, you know, if, if we, uh, if we proceed in, in this direction, uh, um, I guess I'm, I'm most comfortable with, with talking about it perhaps in, in R4, uh, much less, uh, uh, comfortable in our three or, or higher. Uh, and I guess uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the standards that I might be uh, willing to entertain would be uh, uh, prohibition within a certain distance of our uh, one, our two or, or perhaps our three. Uh, I think a distance separation uh, would uh, make me more comfortable. Okay. Um, so I have a question. When the, I don't remember which which development it was, but <clears throat> when the neighborhood business were 
you might have a coffee shop or or a convenience store or something like that. Some neighbors are going ballistic over that, which you know I don't see a problem with. But they're going ballistic. How are they going to feel if instead of a neighbor, instead of a a little restaurant or a pizza place, you're going to move in a storage building? Yeah, but that's that's for single family. I don't think multifamily would have that. I, I think we also talked about the size of the lot, right? Like, so it wouldn't be like yeah, we you wouldn't take you wouldn't take some quarter acre lot and right. next right. to R three and stuff a bunch of storage units there. I don't see that happening. I think we have a good example off of Rodeo Drive. Well, that's yeah. the one that he showed. Yeah, wasn't I mean, it? I you yeah. know, I think that to me, I'd rather live in those duplexes with many storages behind me than a mini mart. Hmm. I mean, I, I don't think they get a lot of traffic. Like Drew said, once a year you go and pick up something. Um, yeah, I mean, this one was the one off of uh, like Quail Run neighborhood. I mean, this is all mature landscaping there, and you've got some topographical, um, you know, po positive aspects to this one yeah but it's so unusual michael they yeah. it's like the two flat roofed houses in town they're <laughs> hidden down under the hill and uh, so that is a uh, uniquely uh sighted uh piece of uh ground there's no doubt about it and you really have to look for that i i suspect there are a lot of people in town that may not know uh, it I even a, exists probably the best example of an in town is actually just south of you scott right where exactly. is. that's pretty much right next to the condos right across the street i'm not saying it's a great location but yeah i mean there's it's a little num number it's a smaller smaller lot number of storage units on that on that lot and, and which one is that on it's just a block over it's on what between Almond. first and a street yeah and for, off of Almond. pretty much directly to the east right, of right. The condos that just got built in that neighborhood but there, yeah, there is a uh, a mix yeah. of of uh, of kinds of uh, development in that area. It's uh, with apartments that are uh, two stories and what have you as well. This is a good time for us to get out our camera and have a, a look at some things that we can respond to because uh, to respond to words and uh, pictures are really since it's e so easy to do pictures as we work on this, we, we should probably uh, do a little slide uh, show for ourselves. Can I ask, so, but, so like when you're describing off of the highway that is tucked behind Quail Run with the weird through residential access, I mean, but those requirements, the, the fence and the trees that they have were from their own due diligence and their own decisions, right? They're not, they weren't, or were they subject to the same landscape buffer yeah they're subject to the same okay. landscape buffer only for the, the fence stuff would have been their for, own yeah it would have been there okay yeah yeah i mean the majority of them are secure and right. that's what makes them secure is the fence that surrounds them and so uh, you know regardless of whether or not you require a fence i think they're still going to put a fence right it's just whether or not you dictate a certain material that it's constructed with so, Mike, are you getting a, a sense of uh, <laughs> what we're interested in enough to uh, proceed to the next phase yeah, of this? Yeah, I could take a crack at uh, you know what what we would include there, and and we could bring it at the next meeting and talk about it. And I could track down some more examples here in town as well and okay. for other places, and and we could look at some yeah, just have another discussion at the next meeting. Okay. Is that uh, yeah. okay with everybody if we proceed like that? Okay. Terrific. Thank you, Mike. This, uh, this is going to get interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so, Joel, you're up next for transportation uh, report. The uh, Transportation Commission will meet in this room uh, uh, tomorrow at 4. And uh, a couple of interesting uh, items on the agenda. One is uh, uh, a... Uh, uh, discussion related to uh, 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 Pullman Moscow transportation uh, options has been uh, um, well, some ongoing uh, discussion of the possibilities and uh, uh, we're 
uh, also going to be uh, uh, discussing an update on the uh, uh, downtown uh, streetscape project, uh, which uh, which I don't know very much about at this point, but uh, uh, it should be interesting. Okay, super. Thank you. Um, under announcements, uh, it just, just occurred to me that, um, and I want to say uh, how much I've appreciated uh, Mike Nelson's participation with us uh, these last, I don't know, probably five or six years, I think he's been with us. But Mike was our second vice chair, and so um, we'll need to don't want to do it by surprise tonight to the next meeting we ought to put that on the agenda and we'll we'll have an election of uh, a new uh, second vice chair uh, Dennis is our vice chair right now and uh, I think not a bad idea to uh, to have that third uh, that third person available <laughs> I, I know at times Joel has filled that role and Mike did at one point in time as as well. So uh, anyway, why don't uh, that and you can all be giving it some thought and we'll uh, we'll revisit the issue at the uh, next meeting. So um, Mike, any uh, previews for the meeting on the 27th? Uh, approval of RCS and uh, maybe further discussion on this item. But we could certainly if yeah, we don't make any headway on that. We certainly could look at canceling that and just looking at the next meeting after that. OK, let's uh, let's see where we uh, where we are. And, uh, you know, no point in a five or 10 or 15 minute uh, meeting. So um, and, you know, if you feel like um, you'll have the time to make uh, sufficient progress for continued discussion on the, the storage, fine. Otherwise, if you want to wait till the following meeting, I guess that would be in May. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Just after it quits snowing. Um, so, okay, with that, uh, anything else for the this good of the my, order? This is Idaho. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, it was fun. All right, with that, meeting is adjourned. Thanks very much.